So welcome to Linux CBT Cast DB Edition. Let's move forward with our configuration by logging into our portal box, which is an Ubuntu desktop. So let's get us going momentarily with a fresh desktop so we can discuss Cassandra DB and its myriad no SQL or no SQL capabilities. So let's open a shell and get our typical notes going with an instance of gedit. This will keep us in the flow by following our linear documentation. So this will be Linux CBT CAS DB edition. And as is typical, we'll start by discussing the myriad features associated with this particular tool before moving on to its actual application across the board. So first and foremost, let's discuss what Cassandra DB or CAS DB is. It is a NoSQL or NoSQL database. So it falls into the category of NoSQL DBs. What exactly does this mean? Well, traditionally databases are based on relational table layouts with references between those tables. Within this new realm of NoSQL, with this new movement, which is represented as the big data space, Data are somewhat related, loosely related, in unstructured and semi-structured and structured formats. So without all of the bells and whistles associated with relational databases, such as constraints associated with, let's say, foreign keys, as well as joins and other features that we associate with database relational databases, the NoSQL space allows us to aggregate data that may be related, let's say, to a particular object, let's say a user, which in today's social environment is a common object. So the user, and the user may have one or more attributes that are of importance that should be spread across that user's activities with, let's say, your website, your application, etc. So again, rather than worrying about relations, joins, and semantics associated with relational database technologies, we can loosely define our data, yet still keeping them somewhat related. So, sans bells and whistles of traditional relational databases. And some examples include, for example, no joins. So we're accustomed to joining data. So for example, you may have a user's table which references attributes associated with that user, such as maybe the products they've purchased, the subscriptions they've purchased, as in our case, and other tables, maybe videos viewed, let's say in our case, progress related to videos, certifications earned, etc. So generally those related tables require joins. So we look up usually one table and patch together the other data from the other tables. So no joins. No foreign keys, for example, enforcing referential integrity, and a host of other features that make the NoSQL or NoSQL space much easier to administer. But along with this stripped down relational layout comes added benefits such as increased scalability or big data. So NoSQL DBs support big data implementations through usually clustering peer-to-peer -peer associations etc. So distributed DBs. So this category allows us usually and then certainly in the case of Cassandra, to spread our data across multiple nodes, even across multiple data, data centers, and all have them run in somewhat of a consistent fashion. So insofar as structure, Cassandra is schema-less for the most part. You can define a schema. There are commands related to schemas, but in its semi-structured or unstructured implementations, no definite schema must be mentioned concerning related data. Again, the example being, let's say, the user being the central point of your data storage for a particular application with one or more attributes. So maybe one user has three attributes, the other user has five attributes. So it's not structured. It's schemaless because you're not imposing the same schema on all users, yet it's still all held together by Cassandra. So it's schemaless, 
And just to elaborate, this basically means that rows have columns that belong to a common term that you'll hear with, with re reference to Cassandra, and that is column families. And as an example, row one, let's say, for a particular user could have four columns, as we've just mentioned. Perhaps row two for another user could have three columns. And you'll see later on how this is implemented. Essentially, where there are differences across rows, the DB simply represents the missing values with, or the non-existing values with null placeholders, which allows it to be unstructured. So distributed DBs, let's just mention again that Cassandra and the NoSQL class gives us distributed databases. So this facilitates single as well as multiple nodes and or DCs or data centers. And that's important because again today we're distributing more and more, especially in the cloud space. Services that come to mind include Rackspace, Amazon, EC2, etc. The ability to spread our nodes across the globe and also have the tools to keep our data consistent is critical. Some other notes regarding the distributed nature include, for example, that every single node in your Cassandra cluster, which is essentially what we will build, form basically an active-active cluster. So there are no, as in the traditional sense, master-slave relations or relationships across these nodes. That's important. So again, basically everyone's a peer. So all nodes are effectively peers. This means that anyone can call the shots, can be reference and proxy requests from clients accordingly to fetch data. So we've distributed items, let's say, across multiple nodes. You can start with a single node eventually to multiple nodes within a single data center, eventually to multiple data centers. All nodes are active-active, which means the client may consult any of the nodes that are members of the cluster and fetch a data accordingly, because each node proxies the requests, which effectively makes all nodes peers. And if they're peers, then everyone knows what's going on, plus or minus some milliseconds to get everyone up to date. So a few refreshers of a page. And even for big applications, if you take, for example, Amazon's general website for selling consumer goods, you'll notice that when certain updates are made, the reference, or there's usually a reference to indicate that it'll take maybe 15 minutes or so. For example, when you add a new product to your seller's account, it usually takes maybe 15 minutes or so for all their nodes globally to be updated. And that's largely because of the distributed database technology that's in place. There will always or invariably be delays across geographic spreads, and that's something we should always be prepared to deal with. So some delays, okay, so long as we have a distributed environment with which to work with. And let's just reiterate that because every node functions as a peer in this active, active to the nth degree model, there are no standby systems or failover systems, which are basically unused resources. Basically, all nodes are working. And you'll see in Cassandra documentation references to linear scalability as you add more nodes then they join the ring and are available to be requested by clients to fetch data to proxy requests or to fetch data firsthand if the data live on that particular node that's consulted at that particular point in time. Insofar as strategies for moving data around for replication, multiple strategies, and it is extensible as all things open source, Multiple strategies exist. They're known as snitches. And these snitches are used to organize the cluster workloads. And they depend largely on your topology, the way you've laid out your Cassandra nodes. So various strategies. So usually simple strategy is usually the default, which pertains to a single data center. But there are strategies, for example, for dealing with, say, EC2. So Let's list some examples. Simple. This is like a single data center 
which is good for starters, which we'll use in our for the bulk of our studies for our intensive purposes. This applies to a single data center, which means any configuration directives concerning data centers and racks are simply ignored. The assumption Cassandra makes, every Cassandra ma node makes with this strategy is that all nodes that form the cluster belong to a single DC. So all nodes belong to one DC. And this is usually the default. We say usually because depending on the implementation, we'll be using the download from the Apache website as opposed to the data stacks bundle. But depending on your implementation, some strategies and other directives may vary. But overall, this is the model that Cassandra follows. So you have a simple snitch, and a number of snitches exist. You have a network snitch, which bases its replication on the topology. You've also got the EC2 snitch, which is based on, of course, AWS or Amazon Web Services. You've got a snitch that runs regardless of the snitch that you use for primary replication decisions, and that's a dynamic snitch. And this is based on performance of nodes. So Cassandra auto routes requests accordingly. So essentially, let's say you've got a six node cluster and two of the nodes are underperforming. Dynamic snitch, which is always enabled, should be able to determine that those two nodes are underperforming and lessen their load and reroute client requests to other nodes accordingly. So this particular snitch is included or used regardless of primary snitch. So it's always there, it's omnipresent. And as we've mentioned, each of these strategies allow us to control replication. So various strategies for organizing cluster workloads controls replication. Now, until we get to a world where all bandwidth are equal, which will probably never happen across geographic distributions, then having strategies or algorithms, if you will, in place for replicating data is very important. So this is what Cassandra terms as snitches. So dynamic snitch, EC2, network, and a number of others which are spelled out. Let's just mention that each strategy, just to clarify, creates basically logical DCs or data centers for grouping Cassandra nodes. So again, EC2 will honor or read and process zone information, geographic information served by AWS to make determinations concerning replication. So you may want to replicate more so within a particular region than without it because of bandwidth costs, associated bandwidth costs. So it's a way of logically assigning our data center resources. Now, perhaps one implementation strategy is that you simply go with the network strategy using the topology and define in your properties file or one of your config files the actual layout of your data center. In other words, teach Cassandra how your data center or data centers happen to be organized, and that way it'll know, based on IPs, data centers, and racks, where to send information, how to replicate. Invariably, if you have multiple data centers, you will replicate across them to ensure that you can survive, your application survives the downtime associated with one or more data centers, but you can reduce or fine-tune or tweak the replication accordingly so that just the amount of information that's necessary to be replicated across data centers or across those bandwidth links occurs and then internally. So for example, site one, site two, maybe one node or any of the nodes replicates to one node at the foreign data center and then that node at the foreign data center or the head node, if you will, will replicate internally at that data center so that your data survive or your data live. So they create logical data centers for us, these strategies. And documentation certainly is on all, online, so you can have a look at that. Now, all nodes, regardless of geo location, effectively belong 
to one cluster, unless you've created multiple clusters. But however you've organized your Cassandra resources, they belong to a cluster. Usually, we simply lump Cassandra nodes into one big cluster, even if you've got 100 data centers across the globe. One data center, and then within that particular, or one cluster across multiple data centers, and then within that particular configuration, we can provision various key spaces or databases, if you will, in RDMS, RDBMS speak, and then replicate those databases according to geolocation, etc., and various strategies. But usually with Cassandra, we organize one huge cluster, and we join the various nodes of those clusters. And your clusters can run thousands or tens of thousands or infinitely scalable numbers of systems. So all nodes, regardless of geolocation, let's just note, maybe ideally belong to one cluster. And this is not a hard requirement, but it simplifies the configuration if you use one data center. So that means we must have a way of segmenting or partitioning data, and that's certainly the case with key spaces, which we'll talk about. So let's just continue to say that each cluster contains one or more key spaces. These are basically databases in relational database management terms, which contain one or more column families. And basically, your column family represents row information. And each key space can be replicated as you see fit. Now, before we get into some of the more technical replication-related details, let's talk some more about some of the other features, the topical features. So Cassandra facilitates, the reason why you want to consider using it, the rapid deployment of DB information or databases. So this basically means that there's less IT and operational involvement. And that is because so long as your developers have access to systems with which they can run Cassandra, which assumes the resources are there, then they can aggregate these resources across the systems and build a distributed database in record time and even produce production applications without, for the most part, involving IT. So, so long as development has web space published to the net and internal systems they can aggregate, then they can build a Cassandra distributed database. So let's just note dev needs web facing systems and internal systems with RAM, JVM, and Linux account to set up Cassandra cluster. So Cassandra need not run as root, which reduces the time to implement across systems. So rapid deployment, that's the whole idea. Traditionally, the model is as follows. Development needs resources, IT slash operations are consulted, and the resources are allocated on the schedule of IT and operations, which can slow the development rollout cycle. So let's just go ahead and save this before we lose it. That's going to be CAS DB edition notes, typical nomenclature. That should save that momentarily. Many more features exist. So because of all this, we reduce the overall implementation costs because of time savings associated with rolling out databases that are production ready. So reduces overall implementation costs compared with traditional SQL RDBMSs. And that is because, again, with traditional databases, IT and operations must be included or involved to provision the resources. Even with virtualization, for example, so the development team needs maybe 500 gigs, a terabyte database space to, within which to store application data. So IT operations are consulted. IT is consulted to find the resources on the wire, provision the instance, 
ensure that storage is available, perhaps ensure that clustering is available so the data are redundant, perhaps across the SQL cluster, let's say using Oracle or otherwise. And then operations gets involved to provision maybe some defaults that are specific to the business, and then turn it over to development. That's your typical organizational rollout, big and small. With Cassandra, the developer is in full control. So the times reduce. In fact, developers need not notify IT slash operations unless you're really streamlined and or they're simply courteous and like to ensure that certain checks are put in place, such as firewalling, operational stamps, such as structures, etc. Maybe updating logbooks, etc. So it reduces the overall implementation costs associated. Insofar as storage, Cassandra stores traditional key value pairs and then some. So it is a key value store, which means a key such as a username, such as let's say Linux CBT or Linux CBT internal may have one or more attributes, meaning fields which make up column families. And that's certainly key value rep representation, but it goes beyond that. So it extends simple key value pairs with the notion of column families. So common families or column families essentially represent rows. So it is midway if not more towards the implementation of traditional RWMS whereas key value pairs are more simplistic. Key value pairs like with memcached for example can store standard key values such as username and a result. Maybe username, password, username, something or some other value. But they're usually not as dynamic, whereas with column families, we can say a particular key rep is represented by n number of attributes. So, i.e., one key, and the key is very important with Cassandra because a key, well, one, it's indexed, it's hashed, and two, it's the, the key piece of information we reference when pulling up a record. So, one key may represent n number of attributes. And those attributes basically are just columns or fields. And those columns or fields are defined as column families. So defined as column families. And we'll remove the single quotes from it. We just want to include single quotes to ensure that we understand that this is the way it's referenced within the Cassandra documentation that this notion of co column families persists. It's the key differentiator between Cassandra and say memcached or some other key value store such as Berkeley DB in that not only are we relegated to or we are not only relegated that is to a key and a value but a key and many values. So key and number of attributes or values. So columns, fields, values and this distinguishes Cassandra. So as so long as we keep the keys unique. So note It is important that each record has a unique key. Now, in the realm of today's big data world, the unique key can usually be boiled down to an object such as a username. So note, this is usually a username. So let's say, take an application such as Facebook, by the way, Cassandra was developed by Facebook. And on Facebook, everyone's unique by various attributes, not only the username as well as perhaps other details such as your full name, the school you attended, other associations, etc. But at the bare minimum, we all have unique logins, unique usernames, which are typically mapped to users' email addresses. So that one key, your email address, for example, which we'll call your username, which is for our system for Linux CBT, the unique identifier for each client, is one hashed by Cassandra if you make it your key in these column families. And two, can then be referenced by multiple attributes. So, and you can scale those attributes to the extent of tens of thousands of columns, unlike traditional RDBMS. So that brings up another example and that is Cassandra facilitates virtually infinite horizontal scaling of attributes mapped to keys.
That's important because as your application grows, so if you're Facebook or some other, and let's say other type of provider of web applications, as new feeds, new attributes, new descriptors, new pieces of information come in that belong to a particular user, you can simply scale in a horizontal fashion, just tack on that new attribute. And perhaps the attribute belongs to one user but not another. So let's say one attribute is what are the various RSS feeds you like to aggregate. So that could simply be an attribute that points to maybe an RSS file, let's say, on the online system, which exists for some but not all users. And for everything you do online, Twitter, RSS, this or that, it just becomes an ever-expanding horizontal column layout or attribute definition. And that makes it virtually infinitely scalable to the right, if you will, or horizontally, unlike traditional RDBMSs. Now back to these key value pairs again. There's some more features we should keep in mind. So these keys that we've mentioned are auto hashed and stored on various nodes. And Cassandra auto handles the mapping of the hash values to various nodes that form your cluster with the insistence so long as you have more than one node that the data be redundant. So if you have two nodes then with a redundancy of two and so on. So the auto hashing takes place and that means when a client, any client, it could be PHP, Python, or just using the standard Cassandra clients as we'll do over our brief look at Cassandra, will be able to query any of the nodes in the cluster and that node that the client's currently connected to will be able to determine where the data live in the cluster. So it could be on some other node, perhaps in a different data center. Hopefully not, but perhaps that is the case. So the keys are auto hash for quick reference. For one, load balancing and quick reference. Th this facilitates that linear scalability. So we don't lump all the keys on one system and just do a duplicate, which is the case with clustering of RDBMSs. They're spread in an intelligent fashion now. With all the versions of Cassandra, this had to be done in some sort of a manual fashion. The assignations of keys, the derivations and assignations of keys had to be done in a manual fashion and assigned manually. But nowadays, it's all automatic through the notion of virtual nodes. So we need not even worry about how Cassandra does it unless we have some other way of organizing our data or some other idea in mind of distributing the data. So the keys, let's just note, keys are evenly mapped to nodes. And this happens let's say with memcached, for example, as a way of caching information, key information, row information. So they're mapped and stored in memory, by the way, with, of course, a disk backup. And let's just also note that timestamps, because obviously in this environment we wonder how does Cassandra keep track of the latest data to ensure that the client gets the latest data. Timestamps are used to determine the latest data. So this, of course, ensures that we get the latest data. And of course, this assumes that time synchronization is in use. So let's just note timestamp resolution of data heavily depends on time synchronization across nodes. And it doesn't matter if the nodes are geographically dispersed in different time zones. So long as you keep them synced, the references can be made based on GMT rather easily. The presentation is merely local. So data are stored, and again, just to reiterate, column families. And each of which can be segregated as needed. And a note about scalability, Cassandra is linearly and virtually infinitely scalable DB architecture. And that's because of its horizontal nation, nature that is because of horizontal scaling.
traditional DBMS scaling is vertical. Make the box bigger and faster, and then we scale horizontally to the extent that the clustering software permits, which is usually limited maybe to a handful of nodes. But with Cassandra, there's really no limit. Another reason why you should consider migrating some of your application data to Cassandra, even if you're initially testing, is the ability to provision commodity resources as part of the DB cluster. So again, so long as you're a developer with access to resources, meaning a login account, non-root, with Java enabled on that particular target system, a JRE, then you can get a Cassandra instance going. And so far as resources, when Cassandra fires up, it defaults to between a quarter and a half of available system memory for the Java heap. The Java heap is its memory space. And this is, of course, configurable. So configured via the main config file, and that's in conf. If a startup, well, the main file is Cassandra YAML, but for startup, you can set the heap size information in Cassandra environment.sh, which is used to fire it up. And you'll be looking at anything related to heap, largely max heap size, for example, as well as heap new size. Have a look at those directives to see how to tweak the memory. But if you have a quarter to half of memory to spare, then, for example, if you're a developer with access to some Linux systems on your network, but you don't have control over RAM resources, then perhaps you'll want to tweak downwards from a quarter to a half. Maybe a quarter to a half is simply too much memory to take from the other roles of that particular system. So we get improved throughput with this model, this linearly horizontally scalable model. So improved throughput over traditional DBMSs or RDBMSs. They're limited. They're simply limited because it's more of a combination of vertical and horizontal with RDBMSs, traditional such as MySQL and Oracle. They go horizontal, but not as horizontal as big data, no SQL models. Tokens are auto generated, and that's 1.2x and higher. So you need not worry about the assignation of tokens. You'll see that with each node that's a part of a cluster, it's associated with one or more tokens for the segmentation of data. And that's how Cassandra makes its decision on how to split the data up. Some more technical matters. Cassandra is fault tolerant, so long as you have more than one node. And this is done through its configuration of replication factors, but it's configurable factors. And basically, these factors are the number of nodes where data exists. They're called replication factors, and they're configured on the key space level. And there's also the notion of consistency levels with respect to reads and writes and so on. But it is fault tolerant, so long as you have, so note, providing more than one node exists and replication factor is greater than or equal to two, meaning your data exists in more than one location, at least two locations, then you can literally power off one box or interrupt it abruptly and your data will continue. Your clients should not notice the difference in access to service. So this means that with this model, there are no SPOFs or single points of failure, as is the case with traditional DBMSs, and certainly we give up some flexibility, such as the referential integrity, join, so on and so forth, so depth in data. But for today's web applications, that much depth isn't necessarily necessary. And again, this is due to data replication across nodes. And remember, when you're dealing with Cassandra, you're thinking about problems concerning how to aggregate considerable amounts of data across perhaps considerable number of nodes, perhaps across numbers of data centers. So when you find yourself in a position where you have to architect data storage needs for an application that must be fault tolerant across maybe more than one node, more than one data center, more than one geographic region, then you're looking at NoSQL classes of database storage systems. And this is where Cassandra is considered the creme de la creme. 
So no single points of failure. And let's just again note, providing that the minimum rep factor is equal to two. That means two nodes are there. And let's just also note that note that internode communications happens every second by default. So they're constantly communicating with one another using the gossip protocol to determine the status of the other nodes in the cluster to determine who's up, who's down, etc. to see where requests should be funneled to and so on. So this means with this no single point of failure, fault tolerant, horizontally distributed, that there's a very small chance of losing data. Now what is that small chance? Well, if all replicas crash, and of course the more replicas you have, the better, within a definable directive of commit log sync period in milliseconds, most of the directives are in milliseconds with respect to time, and then they're expressed in terms of seconds with thousands of milliseconds interval. This is a window where, within which if all of your nodes were cut off, you could lose some data, but it's measured in milliseconds, so you usually will not lose data New data are appended to the commit log. And this is perhaps the key that makes Cassandra so fast. And this happens every another definable directive of commit log sync period in milliseconds. And this defaults to 10 seconds. So what does this mean? Well, when new data are written, let's say from one of your clients, could be the SQL SH or typical Cassandra command line client, or maybe a front end such as PHP or Python writes data into Cassandra. That data will be appended first to the command, to the commit log that is, and then stored in the mem tables in memory so it can be referenced quickly for subsequent requests. And then by 10 seconds flushed out to disk to the actual data files. So you got a 10 second window between memory commit log and data files. And if a crash happens in that point, the commit log will have the appended results. And the appended results make Cassandra much faster. Or this mechanism makes it much faster because instead of reading the entire file or, or seeking to the end of the file, then adding or reading the entire thing and then, then making changes, it just simply appends. So it just keeps adding and adding and adding as you would with, let's say, cat with double greater than symbols to send data to the end of the file. It's a much faster process than reading the file to any degree. So there's less disk read information happening when you append. And of course, in memory, it's written straight to memory like memcache. So that makes it faster as well. And as mentioned, the data are written every 10 seconds. So new data are also written to mem table. That means in memory. And then when full, data are flushed as well as 10 seconds to disk and that's usually in varlib cassandra the default data so you have these three areas where data exists the commit log which is basically your transaction log the fact that new data happened to be written so we let's say we've inserted a new user for our system for our web application so commit log is updated mem table is updated then within the sync period 10 seconds default by then data are flushed to the data files, or if the mem table is full altogether, data are flushed to the data files, which are in varlib Cassandra data with a schema that represents the current schema. So you may have a directory container, which is the main key space for your web app one, for example, which will create like MySQL does for the individual databases. Let's just also note that in addition to this, every 10 second synchronization of data from the commit log, and optionally from the mem table to disk, syncs can also be applied if more advantageous for your environment in batch mode. So sometimes it just might be, perhaps because of bandwidth concerns, to send the syncs maybe off peak. So let's just note that in this mode, it's rep rep recommended that a separate volume for the commit log is used.
And that's, of course, because now you're relying on more data in the commit log that could become corrupted because it hasn't been fully flushed out the disk because you're waiting, let's say, until 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. to batch out your synchronization. So the default is every 10 seconds, seconds to synchronize the data files, but if it's more advantageous because of geographic bandwidth concerns to flush in a batch sense, then that's an option that you should look at, but ensure that you split off the commit log. So if there's a failure in disk between that batch mode synchronization that you don't lose those changes, it'll at least exist in the commit log by reducing the likelihood of the commit log and data directories failing or volumes failing. Quick word about downtime with Cassandra the downtime is zero. That means you get 100% uptime unless the entire Cassandra ring is down. So your ring may contain six nodes, four may fail, and if your default replication factor is two, your data still exists on those two nodes, providing, of course, they have enough storage to facilitate the data, which is, of course, a recommendation that you at least specify a minimum storage per node that joins the ring to cover all your data needs across the failures for that particular configuration. So it's not always possible. Let's say you have maybe 100 terabytes worth of data, but not 100 terabytes per node. Then, of course, your replication factor should be much more than two or three to ensure that those 100 terabytes worth of data are spread accordingly across all of the nodes. So that's a concern as well. We get data center or DC fault tolerance. Again, this is these sorts of features are traditionally very expensive in the RDBMS realm, but with Cassandra it's free, and of course you can use the commercial, commercially supported version. So this is of course the ability to spread data sets across physical data centers. So if you are a big data provider, you could be government, you should be looking at if you haven't already or have not already be looking at Cassandra and just laying these out. You already presumably have access to data center resources, so spread your data across the data centers. Just put a JVM with Cassandra, Cassandra account on each Linux system, and spread this thing out across all your data centers. Now, for those who don't want to give up RDBMSs, Cassandra complements and scales traditional RDBMS implementation. So what you'll find is that the world hasn't given up on RBMS, RDBMSs. This is the default way in which we store data. We use it. Everyone uses it. But what you'll find is that Cassandra excels at these different types of configurations where you need to scale horizontally, either the data structure itself, the column families, and or the actual locations of your data. RDBMSs are used largely where you have, let's say, relations that are complex. joins which bring together those relations referential integrity app constraints maybe there isn't a client for your application to connect to Cassandra but that should be forthcoming Cassandra and no SQL implementations that are similar are used where relations are less complex so take again an online system such as Facebook or Google or otherwise. In that world, you think things must be complex because there's so much for every service from what you're reading through your RSS XML or your RSS feeds to your various friends in your circles to the various friends on Facebook and the different feeds that you're a part of and groups and so on. It looks complex, but it really isn't. It's again, everything's tied to a user, and a user just simply has n number of attributes, and maybe those attributes jump key spaces. So maybe one attribute is an RSS, and, or the fact that you do use RSS, and then that RSS attribute looks up another key space in another Cassandra cluster or within the same Cassandra cluster, which enumerates all of the various RSSs. So you can infinitely continue to scale. Now let's just include as another feature that Cassandra improves the performance. So improve performance over RDBMS via extensive caching. And this is provided in two forms. The ability to cache keys, which is enabled by default. 
and the ability to cache entire rows. And of course this is memory expensive and extensive. Default enabled for keys. So you can cache keys, let's say the key is your username, and that particular username is auto-hashed, auto-cached, Cassandra knows immediately where to find it. It's on node number four in the first data center. Or you can cache the entire row. So in addition to the key username, the n number of attributes are all in memory and quickly available. And this is again like memcache, where you cache the entire row. Memcache, of course, by default doesn't store the data in a persistent fashion unless you use memcache db or a third party means of storing memcache data. Let's just also note that failed nodes are auto synced when rejoined to the cluster with minimal effort. So within a particular threshold, usually a couple hours, no problem, just bring the node back online. It'll eventually catch up without that particular range, let's say outside of the three hours or so, or whatever you've tweaked the sync area to be, it's default three hours. Then you have to do a little work to get it up to, up to speed, but it's not much whatsoever, so you can get it back. Again, just to reiterate, so that you don't think Cassandra is like memcache D in the sense that it's only in memory. So unlike memcache D, which we also use and love, data persists within Cassandra because it's committed to permanent storage regularly. And by regularly, we mean, of course, every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds by default or batch mode or mem tables full. These are your three conditions where data will be written to disk, certainly every 10 seconds written to disk, certainly in memory, and certainly in the commit log. So if there's a gap between the commit log and a failure that prevented or caused the gap preventing Cassandra to write to disk, then the commit log will be retroactively reclaimed and as a consequence, the updates will be written accordingly. There are various client libraries so don't think this is an only open source affair or just one or two tools for example Python which is ubiquitous it's PyCasa or Picasa Ruby PHP which is PHP Casa and a host of other clients just consult online to see what clients are available at the Apache Foundation certainly there's commercial support third-party support that is and perhaps the most prominent is Datastax. And Datastax, just to give them their due credit, provides community, which is of course free, open source, and enterprise grade Cassandra bundles. So what we'll be looking at is the raw bundle from Apache. Typically we look at package bundles, but we're not looking at Cassandra initially in an in-depth fashion. We're looking at it topically by pulling it off the Apache website, looking at some of the features, getting some things to work, just to warm you up to this world of not necessarily big data, but clustering, data clustering. And then once you have a feel for Cassandra, everything else is an overlay. So for example, data stacks, Community Edition, which is free, bundles the latest Cassandra for your platform, let's say Red Hat, Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, etc., SUSE, and then once you've got that there, you'll see that the op center overlay calls the very same tools that we will have used in our cursory study or glance of Cassandra. So again, this notion of big data, it's just peer-to-peer -peer networking, the ability to spread data across many commodity systems. Linux is famous for this. This is what it's all about, spreading things all over the place, peer-to-peer -peer sharing of music, files, videos, this and that. So what it's about, spreading commodity systems across perhaps the cloud, and scaling your data to ensure that you never lose your data. So that said, let's take a deeper look across our systems, see what the architecture looks like, and start setting up Cassandra.